Hello, everyone. Welcome to How to Read Chinese Poetry podcast. I'm Zhong Qicai, the program host. In this podcast program, my colleagues and I aim to introduce cutting-edge scholarship on Chinese poetry to a broad general audience. We will present 52 episodes covering the major poetic genres developed over China's long history. Each episode features close reading of one or more of the best-known Chinese poems, with an aim to illuminate their literary greatness and cultural significance. For all the discussed poems, Chinese texts, English translation, romanization, and brief notes are provided at our website, howtoreadchinesepoetry.com. By following the 52 episodes, listeners will gain a bird's eye view of the thematic, formal, and generic evolution of Chinese poetry from antiquity to the modern era. Instruct and delight is what we wish to accomplish in each talk. Without further ado, let's begin. Having discussed the poems of The Wandering Man in the last two episodes, we now turn our attention to the poems of The Abandoned Woman. In these poems, male literati poets seem to adopt the abandoned woman's persona as a means of subtly expressing their own grievances. By Han time, a woman abandoned by her law was conventionally compared to a scholar official out of favor with his former political patrons. Speaking in the voice of frail, abandoned woman, the poet aims to express not only his complaint of abandonment by his patron, but also his forlorn loyalty, all in the hope of regaining his patron's favor. By foregrounding the issue of aging, he often turned his political woes into a painful awareness of life's brevity. Now let's look at the most famous poem of Abandoned Woman in the 19-old poems. We fought south of the walls. We fought south of the walls and died north of the ramparts. Dead in the wilderness and unburied, the crows may eat us. Tell the crows for us. Cry for us strangers, away from home. We died on the moors, and certainly would not be buried. How can our rotting flesh run away from you? The water is deep and clear. The rushes and reeds are dark. Valiant steeds have died in battle, while nags neigh running around. Bridges have been made into houses. How can one go south? How can bridges go north? How can the grain be harvested? Wish our Lord eat? We wish to be lower subjects, yet how can we achieve that? We long for you, fine vassals. Fine vassals are truly worth longing for. You are now in the morning to fight. And in the evening, you did not return. Like most poems in the collection, this poem does not display a distinct binary structure. Instead, it strikes us as a mosaic of emotional snapshots, taken in different times and places, presenting in eight consecutive couplets. The first couplet, quote, On and on, and on and on you go. I cannot but live apart from you, unquote conveys at once 
the dragging pain of the husband's long journey, and the mental suffering endured by the abandoned woman, as we watch him disappear down the long road, and beyond the horizon. The second couplet, quote, "The distance has grown ten thousand li and more. We are now at the opposite end of the sky." Unquote. Is a painful reckoning of the distance now separating her from the, her husband. Then the third couplet, quote, "The road is ragged and long. How can I know when we shall meet again?" Unquote. Reverses the spatial perspective from picturing an outbound journey to waiting for a return. And changes the temporal perspective from past to future. The pain of separation now becomes even more unbearable, as she cannot know when, if ever, he will return. The fourth couplet abruptly shifts from thoughts of homeward people to animals. Quote, the Tartar horses lean towards the northern wing. The yew flower rests among the southern branches. Unquote. The second half of the poem brings a dramatic change in the speaker's perception of time. In the first four couplets, his sense of time is measured in unhappy events. Time seems to drag, because she yearns for an end to the separation. But in the fifth couplet, she awakens to a different kind of time, one measure against her own biological life. Quote, day by day, our parting grows more remote. Day by day, my robe and belt grow. Day by day, my robe and belt grow looser. Unquote. To anyone who treasures life. All the passage of time is too swift. All signs of、uh, aging too saddening. Seeing the time's passage in this new light, the wife breaks into lament in the penultimate couplet. Quote, Thinking of you makes one old. Years and months are suddenly gone. Unquote. This dramatic, ironic shift. In her perspective, time marks the transformation of her sorrow over separation into a melancholy over the hastened process of aging. To extricate himself from this existential sorrow, she resorts to a capitium of a different kind, not hedonistic enjoyment, but a disciplined daily intake of food. At least to get by. As I have demonstrated in the previous two episodes, the binary structure seen in most of the 19-0 poems is born of a sustained process of reflection, starting from external observation, and usually ending with a philosophical statement on human transience. By contrast, a mosaic. Integration of emotional snapshot in this poem seems to betray all the symptoms of emotional brooding. Thinking about one single issue, in this case, separation. Again and again, until the speaker pulls herself from disappear, and make a sensible pledge to endure. Also, this mosaic structure is used less often than the binary forms in later poetry. It seems the preferred conduit of intense lyrical expression, as shown in some of the Tao Chen's poem to be discussed in the next topic. This is the end of episode twenty-one. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy the talk. Let us relax and listen to a reading of the poem in Mandarin. 
古诗十九首，行行重行行，行行重行行，与君生别离，相去万余里，各在天一涯。道路阻且长，会面。安可知？胡马依北风，月鸟朝南枝。相去日已远，衣带日已缓。浮云蔽白日，游子不顾返。思君。令人老，岁月忽已晚。弃捐勿复道，努力加餐饭。